today we're going to continue with the writing series that we started last week, talking about how to write complete sentences and using correct sentence structure. So today's language tip then to help you prepare for the Kale test or to even complete assignments if you're already registered at college or university, we'll be focusing on the sentence structure, specifically on complex sentence structure writing. Now, just before we get into the complex structure, I'd like to take a very quick minute to review some of the structures we looked at last week, just so that it's fresh in our mind, because we'll be adding on with some new steps today. So we already discussed then what a simple sentence requires. So every sentence we write has to have a subject and a predicate. So the subject will be who or what the sentence is about. And in these two simple sentences, you can see that scientists and they form the subject. We've underlined them. The predicate is just the rest of the words in the sentence that tell you what the subject is doing. The predicate will always include a completed verb, and the verbs here have been highlighted yellow so that we can keep track of them. So should reanalyze and can correct are the two verbs. So altogether, we have two complete simple sentences. Now, when we started looking at compound sentence structure, all we did is we took both simple sentences that we had created and we connected or combined them together using a joining word. The joining word in this example sentence is so, and we call those joining words conjunctions. So this whole sentence now is a compound one and it reads, scientists should reanalyze established conclusions and facts so they can correct unwarranted biases. All right, now the type of conjunction that we looked at in order to make a compound sentence is what we call a coordinating conjunction. And there are only seven coordinating conjunctions in English. If we can remember the fanboys word, we'll remember all seven of those conjunctions. For and nor, but or yet so. So by taking one of those conjunctions and putting it in the center or the middle of our compound sentence, we should then have two complete sentences, which we call independent clauses, on either side of the conjunction, like you see here. So we've written the independent clause within the red brackets. Okay, let's add on to that now. Let's get into the next language segment of today's episode. So I have here a clause on the screen, and I'm going to ask the question if we believe together that this is an independent clause. So the idea on the screen reads, even though David was thoroughly prepared to deliver his final presentation in class today. So in order for us to see if it's independent, meaning if it's complete and can stand by itself, we need to identify the subject and the predicate. So we know that the subject of this sentence is David. We do see a verb, which we need, and the verb is highlighted yellow, which is was prepared. And most of the words in that sentence tell us what David is doing. We know that he was thoroughly prepared to deliver his final presentation in class today. But I've got two words at the beginning of my sentence that are creating a, a rather unfinished idea. If I was to take away, even though, what I have left is definitely an independent clause. This sentence is complete by itself and it doesn't need any help whatsoever to finish the thought. When I do have these two words starting my sentence, even though it sets up an unfinished or incomplete thought. And when we have an incomplete idea, we refer to them as the dependent clause. All right, so again, we should know by now what an independent clause is. Well, a dependent clause is the opposite. If independent means you're a strong enough person to stand all by yourself, and the independent sentence can stand by itself, Consider the opposite. If you are a dependent person, if you depend on your friend to come help you move furniture to a new apartment, then that means you need help finishing the action. And the same goes for dependent clauses in English. A dependent clause also needs help to finish the thought because it's not quite complete on its own. So even though we do have a subject and a completed verb here, we don't have an idea that's complete. And we call that a fragment. All right, that's basically what dependent clauses are. They suggest sort of half of an idea, but we would need to write another clause at the end of the sentence if we wanted to finish the idea. 
So those blue words there at the beginning of our clause, even though, these are also conjunctions. These are also connecting words, but they belong to a different group of conjunctions than we looked at last day. So those fanboys words create, used to create compound sentences, we call those coordinating conjunctions. But the word even though and the rest of the, the words on this list are what we call subordinating conjunctions. They still join ideas together, but they're used in a slightly different way. All right, now there are many, many subordinating conjunctions in English. There are probably 50 or more. Uh, where these, this group of 12 conjunctions that you see before you are probably uh, the more commonly used conjunctions that you will be using in your writing and also as you speak to join ideas together. So they are arranged here alphabetically. Um, I chose to put although and even though together just because they mean pretty much the same thing. But otherwise, you'll see these words are listed alphabetically. So let's get back to the actual structure of our sentence. In order to complete the idea, make sure that the sentence is finished and we understand what's happening, we have to connect that dependent clause that we started with to an independent idea. So you can see that we've written a complete independent clause or a simple sentence at the end of this idea. All right, I'll put that in red brackets for us. So the dependent clause comes first, the independent clause here follows second. So the entire sentence from beginning to end reads, even though David was thoroughly prepared to deliver his final presentation in class today, a heavy snowstorm overnight prompted school officials to close the campus for the day. So now we have a complete sentence. The entire idea makes sense with the two clauses attached together. And when we take a dependent clause and we combine it with an independent clause, we have created a complex sentence structure. So this is one of our goals for academic writing. We want to start creating longer, more complex ideas, right? And this is how one way to do it. You notice though, we can also reverse the order. We still have both types of clauses together, but this time we're going to start with the independent idea and finish with the dependent one. So we haven't changed any vocabulary words whatsoever. We've just literally cut and pasted and rearranged the order. So it now reads, a heavy snowstorm overnight prompted school officials to close the campus for the day, even though David was thoroughly prepared to deliver his final presentation in class today. All right, again, the independent idea has been placed inside those red brackets to keep it separate. That's the most important part of the sentence. You absolutely have to have an independent clause, otherwise you don't have a sentence at all, okay? The secondary or dependent clause that follows, you'll notice it's the part of the sentence that contains the subordinating conjunction, which is in this case, even though. So let's take a look at the two versions of the same idea side by side. All right, so the top version starts with our dependent clause because we've got the conjunction even though, and then the bottom example there actually starts with the independent part, a heavy snowstorm. So the conjunction here, even though, falls in the middle of that sentence. So yes, I've rearranged the, the structure here or the, uh, the order rather of the clauses, but there's also one more difference that I want to point out here because it's a grammar rule that we need to memorize. So have a look then at these two sentences. They are both complex, they are both correct. Can you spot the other very tiny difference between them? And I'm going to pull out my little laser pointer here to show you. So you notice there's a comma right here in this example, but we don't have any comma whatsoever in the bottom example. And this is a really important rule to memorize. So when we start with the, uh, the dependent clause, so even though David and on, when we start with the dependent clause, we have to put a comma at the end of that idea. And it's going to separate the dependent part from the independent piece that follows, which you see in the red brackets. But in the bottom example, we're starting with the independent or the completed section first. And as a result, we don't need any comma whatsoever. So you're going to have to find a way that works for you to help you remember in which case you use the comma. Okay, I always think of it as if I'm starting with the dependent part, that's the weaker part. 
it's going to need all the help it can get in order to attach to the strongest part of the sentence. So I'll need to add that comma in to make it a smooth connection. That's how I've always thought of it. Whereas in the bottom, I'm starting with the independent or the complete part, and it's strong enough to be by itself, so it can just keep right on running into the dependent clause. That might be one technique, I don't know. Find one that works for you, but that has always helped me keep the comma rules straight. It is a very small point, but it's also a very important one. So just to sort of finish off here today, let's have a look at one or two more examples of complex structure. So here in the top, we started again with the dependent piece, but we're going to use a different conjunction. We're using the word because. So we have, because the internet connection is weak in our head office downtown, technicians will install significant upgrades next week. All right, you'll notice that because we started with that conjunction, the dependent piece, we've added in the comma. In the bottom, we have, technicians will install significant upgrades next week because the internet connection is weak in our head office downtown. So we started with the independent, strong, complete part, so no comma is necessary. Okay, and the last thing I, I want you to make sure you're remembering from today's lesson here is that your independent clause, your complete sentence itself, will never ever have the conjunction within it. So when you look within these red brackets, you'll notice that this part of the sentence could actually stand all by itself if you wanted it to. It, it would be a simple sentence if it were by itself, but because we're attaching it to the dependent clause on either side of it, we turned it into a complex structure. Okay, we'll do one more. So this one we're using when as an example of our subordinating conjunction. So in the top piece, we have when I decided to immigrate to Canada, I was overcome with excitement at the opportunities that lay ahead. And below, we've rearranged the order and we now have I was overcome with excitement at the opportunities that lay ahead when I decided to immigrate to Canada. Okay, so we'll find our independent ideas. They are the clauses that do not have uh, any conjunctions within them. And you'll also notice that in the top, because we started with the dependent piece with the conjunction, we have a comma. In the bottom, we started with the independent or strong part of the sentence, so no comma is needed. All right, so I'm hoping that by now you're a little more comfortable working with the two types of clauses in your writing, so the independent and the dependent clauses, and that you can practice creating your own compound and complex sentence structures with these. Next week, we're going to start looking at some paragraph structure. So join me then. Take care and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.